starting point is to consider the fact that we're talking about the significance of a place today and the significance of it first of all to God and because of that the significance to it uh, to God's people. This is what the sons of Korah could say about Mount Zion. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God. His holy mountain, beautiful in elevation, is the joy of all the earth. Beautiful in elevation. It's, um, it's not exactly Mount Everest. It's, um, I believe, about 765 metres high. Um, Mount Snowden, I know we're not allowed to call it Mount Snowden anymore, but Mount Snowden, um, just over a thousand metres in elevation by comparison. And yet, the author of the psalmist here describes it as beautiful in elevation and the joy of all the earth. The significance of this place leads to that description of the place. The purpose of, of this first presentation is to consider, first of all, the history of Zion in the Old Testament, albeit briefly, and not just to consider it from a, a sheer factual point of view, but to consider what lessons we can learn from the history. When the Jews wrote history, they wrote history with the intention of teaching us something. And so we want to try and learn something from the history of Zion as we see it revealed from Genesis through to the Old Testament. Um, but we also, as Graham said, we want to lay a foundation where some of the principles that apply for us today and into the future will also be beginning to be seen, hopefully, as, as we survey the Old Testament on this subject. So, Zion is a theme in the Scriptures that comes up time and time again. In the Old Testament, it's mentioned 160 times. And that's my remit today. So compared to the New Testament where it's mentioned seven times, I'm not planning, I think you'll forgive me, that I'm not planning to refer to all 160 references to Zion. And, and that doesn't even include all the references to Jerusalem, uh, to the temple, to Israel, to worship, and all the other associated themes. But we want to, um, we do want to read a couple of key scriptures. And so I'd like you to turn with me, if you would, to uh, Deuteronomy chapter 12. I'm reading from the ESV, in case you're wondering. These are the statutes and rules that you shall be careful to do in the land that the Lord, the God of your fathers, has given you to possess all the days that you live on the earth. You shall surely destroy all the places where the nations whom you shall dispossess serve their gods, on the high mountains and on the hills and under every green tree. You shall tear down their altars and dash in pieces their pillars and burn their asherim with fire. You shall chop down the carved images of their gods and destroy their name out of that place. You shall not worship the Lord your God in that way. But you shall seek the place that the Lord your God will choose out of all your tribes to put his name and make his habitation there. There you shall go, and there you shall bring your burnt offerings and your sacrifices, your tithes and the contribution that you present, your vow offerings, your free will offerings, and the firstborn of your herd and your flock. And there you shall eat before the Lord your God, and you shall rejoice, you and your households, in all that you undertake, in which the Lord your God has blessed you. And then if you just skip down to verse 13 with me. Take care that you do not offer your burnt offerings at any place that you see, but at the place that the Lord will choose in one of your tribes, there you shall offer your burnt offerings, and there you shall do all that I am commanding you. So here's the vision laid out for Israel, that God will choose a place that will be the center for their collective worship. And what you see is God's choice, but you also see a responsibility for the people to seek that choice. 
So you have God, selection, and the people seeking. And, and that was what the Lord said to them. A place that the Lord would choose. And then later we, we come to Psalm 132. And if you can turn with me there. Psalm 132 is um, not ascribed to David. But it's certainly about David. And it's about David's passion. And here we have a person who sought that place that God had chosen. I'm going to read verses 1 to 8 first of all. Remember, O Lord, in David's favour, all the hardships he endured, how he swore to the Lord and vowed to the mighty one of Jacob, I will not enter my house or get into my bed. I will not sleep. I will not give sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids until I find a place for the Lord, a dwelling place for the mighty one of Jacob. Behold, we heard of it in Ephrathah. We found it in the fields of Jar. Let us go to his dwelling place. Let us worship at his footstool. So there you have a depiction of David. And you might say, even from his early days, growing up in Ephrathah, you read there, don't we, in um, verse 6, Behold, we heard of it in Ephrathah. We know David was a man who meditated on the word of God day and night. And I can imagine him even as a younger guy, meditating on the word of God. And he would be familiar with Deuteronomy. He'd be familiar with this vision that the Lord had for a place. And so even from his early days, I can imagine he had a passion that he wanted to seek out this place. And then the reference to Jar there. We know from elsewhere in the scriptures that that's a reference to a place called kiriath Jirim, where the ark rested for a time, and yet this was David's passion to bring it into what became the capital city, which we'll see in a minute. And so then if we go further down in Psalm 132, we read verses um, 13 and 14, and this is the Lord's response, if you like. It says, For the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his dwelling place. This is my resting place forever. Here I will dwell, for I have desired it. I love that interaction. We've thought about the interaction of heaven and earth. Well, here's an interaction between God's desire and a human being's passion. And this is a vision that requires human passion. And so it's challenged me. And I'd like to pass on the challenge. What keeps me awake at night? What, what gives me um, a painful passion because I care about it so much? David wouldn't give sleep to his eyes until this dwelling place had been found. And I'd like to challenge you, what is your passion? Do you have a passion for this vision that God has? We come to these words, don't we, of David? I will not give sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids until I find a place for the Lord, a dwelling place for the mighty one of Jacob. It talks about his afflictions at the beginning of Psalm 132. Remember, O Lord, in David's favour, all the hardships or afflictions he endured. The NIV says his self-denial. And it reminds me what it says about the Lord Jesus, that zeal for the house has eaten him up, consumed him. When you're passionate about something to that degree, there's, there's a pain involved. You lose sleep over what you, you're concerned about because you, you care about this thing that's in the heart of God and that he desires so much. So Psalm 132 brings that vision of God and the seeking of a person together. If you go to Jerusalem today, Mount Zion would be referred to as the, the high hill. But as Graham pointed out, Zion is, is really a reference. It's um, a synergy, if you like, for the bigger thing. It's um, a reference to Jerusalem as a city. It's a reference to the capital, the centre of worship. And so that's how we want to view it. We think about Jerusalem as, as a city. And the Raya and Zion and the various parts of Jerusalem come into the history. So, as I say... We want to try and attempt a brief history of Zion. 
But what I want to do is try to incorporate into that history the two themes we've mentioned, which is God's purpose that he is determined to fulfill, but the human um, weaknesses in many ways, but also the human passion that enables that vision to be fulfilled on earth. And so, right at the beginning, it's occupied by a Canaanite tribe, the Jebusites, who um, was, were the tribe that came from Canaan, the son of Ham. And uh, we can, I won't read the references, but you can have the slides if you want to look at it later. Even as early as Abraham, though, we, we see, and I know many of you are familiar with this history, of course, we see an early, interesting, out-of-the-blue reference to what will become a unique city that stands apart from the pagan worship of the nations and the Canaanites. And you'll remember after Abraham's victory um, in the, the war with the, the kings and that battle, Melchizedek comes to meet him and he's described. His name means king of righteousness and he is the king of Salem, which is an early name for Jerusalem. Salem means peace. So here we have this character who is the king of righteousness and also the king of peace, if you like, and the king of a location. And he's called the priest of God Most High. So even in those early days, there seems to be, out of the blue, a character who appears who is a priest and a king who serves the Most High God in the midst of all of these Canaanite tribes. The wonderful glimpse that you see of principles that will come into place in the future. Um, principles of kingship, which make us think about obedience and service. Um, the, the principle of priesthood, which makes us think about sacrifice and, and worship. And not only that, but Melchizedek blesses Abraham and Abraham gives a tenth of everything. So there's the principle of what we bring, what we give, and the tithe. And all of this comes into place as early as Melchizedek and, and Abraham. And there's references there in the Psalms and in Hebrews as well, as you know. And then Abraham is commanded to take his son Isaac to a very specific location. He says, go to the land of Moriah. And it says that he was told to, um, to go and take, um, he was told to go to one of the mountains I will show you. To the land of Moriah, go to one of the mountains that I will show you. So even there, isn't that a clue that God has a place in mind and it's important to him? Why would he command Abraham to go a three day journey from the land of the Philistines where he was at the time? to go to this very specific location. And so immediately we start associating this place with a significant history of Israel, with sacrifice, and with what became a very, very close and intimate picture of the Lord Jesus as well being sacrificed for us. But human beings don't succeed in fulfilling what God wants us to do. Where was the passion to seek this place for so many years? In, in Joshua and Judges, we read that of all the, the land of Israel that Israel went to conquer, Jerusalem was left unconquered in the sense that the Jebusites, the Canaanite tribes, still lived and resided in that area. They were commanded to be driven out, and they weren't driven out. And it says that the people of Judah in Joshua's day couldn't drive out the Jebusites from, from this particular location. And the same in Judges, there was a battle which resulted in, in, in destruction to the city of Jerusalem as it was then. But they still couldn't drive out the people who were there. Now, could they not do it because they didn't have the strength? Could they not do it because it wasn't the time? Or because the Jebusites were too strong in those days? That's not consistent with what the Lord had said to the Israelites, is it? The reason, I would suggest, is that they lacked Anybody with that passion and desire and faith to go and take the fortress that was the, the stumbling block, if you like, for driving out the Jebusites. Until, of course, you get to David. And I think David is a key person and a key character in all of this narrative, isn't he? Because here's a man who we know from the Psalms 
was, first of all, passionate for the Word of God. And so that's the starting point for receiving um, a vision of what is on God's heart, what's on God's mind, is by being passionate for God's Word. And even as a young man, I would suggest, he was passionate for God's Word. That made him passionate for God. He is described as a man after God's own heart. And if you're a man or a woman after God's own heart, then you're going to be a man or a woman who seeks whatever is on God's heart that you know is on God's heart. And if you know that this is something that's on God's heart, then you'll seek it, and you'll seek it restlessly like David did according to Psalm 132. And so we read in 2 Samuel 5, and we will just read this. Um, in 2 Samuel 5, if you turn with me, and this is David. And the king and his men went to Jerusalem against the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, who said to David, You will not come in here, but the blind and the lame will ward you off. That's them taunting David thinking David cannot come in here. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion, that is, the city of David. So, there's a picture here, an artistic impression of what the city of David would have looked like in those days when it was first conquered, the Jebusites driven out, and the city built up to become the capital where David made his base. And you'll recognize it as the slightly lower of the two hills that came up before. And if you follow it up the hill, you get to Mount Moriah where the temple ended up getting built. And you can see from the picture, can't you, what it would have felt like from a human perspective. How intimidating is it to, to go to a fortress like that and to be taunted by the Jebusites who've been there for centuries and who felt that nobody had ever conquered them so far. So... What are you going to do, David? Bring it on, they were saying. And, and David had the faith, and he had the passion, and God gave him victory. And I want to challenge all of us about that, because hopefully we can apply that in our present day, that where there's faith and where there's passion for what God wants, then God will give the victory. And so it became the city of David, and the fortress of Zion is the first reference to Zion. In, in the scriptures. This is where we read about Zion for the first time. It was a fortress. A fortress that the Jebusites hid safely behind until a man of David's caliber came. And with God's strength and power, of course, the city became his. We will um, continue to skip briefly if we can. That's why I put an exclamation mark there to remind me of the importance to be brief. The Ark of the Lord represents the presence of God. And so the Ark of the Lord had to be brought into this place. The place that God had chosen. The place that David had, see, uh, had sought out. As Israel were commanded to seek out. And he brought the Ark into the city of David. We know that it didn't go smoothly. He was complacent. And we know the story of Uzar. And how initially there was complacency about how to deal with that journey. And it resulted in despondency. It resulted in anger. And then... He recovered from that, and the ark was brought in with great rejoicing into the city of David. Even David wasn't perfect, and David's sin almost brought destruction to this city of Jerusalem. David's sin in taking the census, if you remember, he wanted to take a census, and we believe it was a sin of pride, lacking faith in God, and it brought a plague on the land. And it's really interesting when we read in 2 Samuel 24 that the plague um, was, uh, it caused 70,000 deaths in Israel from as north as Dan all the way down to Bathsheba, I think, um, Bathsheba, I think it says, um, which is south of Jerusalem. But then Jerusalem as a city, it says the, the destroying angel was about to extend his hand over Jerusalem and we read that God intervenes and says, it is enough, now stay your hand. So human weakness doesn't stop the Lord from achieving and protecting the place of his vision. And so Jerusalem was spared, and not only was it spared 
but it leads us to the next bit of the journey where David was commanded to establish an altar on Mount Moriah. It was previously a, a, a threshing floor belonging to a Jebusite called Ornan or um, Awona, depending on whether you read the account in one book or another. But that was a piece of land which David had to acquire and he acquired it by paying for it. And you'll remember that he, he established the principle there that to establish an altar is to bring worship to God and worship means sacrifice. He said to Ornan, I will not take this place for free because I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord that cost me nothing. And so now we have the center of worship with an altar and with that principle of sacrifice that is connected to worship. When we think about our sacrifice on the Lord's Day morning, when we bring our worship, are they not um, offerings of, of sacrifice to the Lord? David was the one who had the vision to build a temple. The ark was moved to the city of David, but it was still in a tent, just like the tents in Billington, I suppose except the tabernacle was there. But he wanted a temple, and he had the vision for the temple. This was a man of such great passion, wasn't he? Um, it was Solomon who was going to build the temple, and we read about how the temple was built on Mount Moriah, which was that higher peak of the lower of the two hills of Jerusalem. And so that's a brief history of Zion that takes us to the glory days. And the glory days were so brief, don't you think? If you know the history, you have Solomon, you have the temple, you have a united nation with one capital and one centre of worship. And yet one generation later, just one generation later, we have the beginning of a decline. And why is that? Is, is human weakness such that we, we just can't continue with the vision that God has for us? We just... So by default, don't we? we? We stray from God's word and we, we stray downhill back into old ways. Solomon led astray back to idols. Um, it was all the women's fault, of course, wasn't it? His many wives, concubines. But he, um, he was the one who triggered that decision for the kingdom to become divided. And so Jeroboam became the person who took over the, the northern tribes and we read um, about the words that that were spoken to Jeroboam through a prophet and so God spoke to Jeroboam about how the kingdom was going to be torn and Jeroboam was going to take ten tribes but he was going to protect Jerusalem he was going to keep this vision, keep this remnant and he was going to protect it by keeping one tribe which was David's tribe and so there became a divided kingdom. But ten out of the twelve tribes of Israel suddenly went back to what must have just seemed completely um, the same as the old pagan worship. Jeroboam set up an altar in uh, the north, in Dan, and then in the south, not too far away from Jerusalem, but you didn't have to go as far as Jerusalem. You could go to Bethel, or you could go to Dan if you were lived in the north, or if you didn't want to go to those places, you could worship in any of the high places that Jeroboam set up. And so in the north, you suddenly have um, a departure from this vision that was so precious to God. And it was only in Jerusalem and in Judah that the vision was maintained. But then, of course, we come to about 590 BC, and Judah go into exile as well. Someone's described the Bible as a tale of two cities. And one of them we're talking about today, and that's Jerusalem. The other one is Babylon. And we'll see Babylon from Genesis through to Revelation as well. But here's the people of Israel, Judah, exiled into Babylon. And we know their sorrow when they were by the waters of Babylon. And they sat down and wept because they remembered Zion. How could they sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? They had many songs about Zion. Fourteen of them are, are, are specifically depicted as songs of ascent in the book of Psalms, Psalms 120 to 134. I've always admired anybody who feels like singing when they're walking uphill 
Um, but that's what the Israelites wanted to do, because they were, they were going to worship in Zion, and they made songs to sing on the way, the songs of Zion. But they couldn't sing them in Babylon. Well, so there we must leave it uh, just for today. Next week, Andy will continue this talk and provide us with these conclusions, thinking about God's revelation to his people, his rest among his people, how he reigns over his people, and God's response to his people, all in the Old Testament setting of how these things were true in regard to Zion, Jerusalem, of those Old Testament days. And we'll move on and think about how these things have application to our service for God today and his revelation to us and his rest among us and his reigning over his kingdom today and his response to his people who call upon him. And so we invite you to come back next week. Please take the time to uh, make a diary note next Saturday, 8 p.m. And the Mount Forest House Church will be pleased to share this uh, continuation of the talk by Andy Seddon on Destination Zion. Every tear we draw